Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show. This week we are exploring five myths around the stock market. Plenty to digest in this, and there may be some widely heard stories that you've come across. Just because you've heard them doesn't mean they're true. Look forward to seeing in the show. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitchell Lorenzo. Always asking the tough questions, and today I will be certainly doing that, AB, because we're going to talk about something that comes up a lot. We talk to clients a lot when they join us, we speak to them face-to-face, and we hear a lot of these same comments. So today we're going to talk about the top five biggest stock market myths. Only five. There's plenty we could uh, hundreds, shoe- hundreds, hundreds we, we could, could go through. shoehorn plenty in there, and I think, yeah, I, it's 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 interesting. It's one of those things in life. I think sometimes when you've heard things over and over again, you start to think, well, that must be true. And just because you've heard it doesn't mean it's true. I guess it comes out to today's world. You know, there's the truth, and then everyone these days is, oh, my truth is this. You know, that's not the truth, is it? So anyway, let's put a pin in the balloon of some of these nonsense myths. Let's get stuck into it. What do you got for me? Okay, well, this is the number one. If you Google stock market myth, this is what comes up. And ultimately, this is the one that I hear the most. And that's that investing in the stock market is like gambling. Mm. In actual fact, there are plenty of edges that you can gain. Hundred um, percent. I mean, the idea of of approaching a market and, and investing per se is that you are number one, obviously, trying to make money. And the best way to do that is to build up an edge where the balance of probability is tipped in your favour. If you're gambling, you know, at best, things are usually fifty fifty. You know, two teams playing foot, footy, two boxes in the ring. You know, we've seen some plenty of recent examples of, of those things where upsets can happen. And 50-50 odds, coin toss, is not great. Um, you know, so what can you do about it? And I think that's where the idea of upskilling and approaching investment decisions through a particular set of lenses with some certain checkboxes can go a long way to increasing the probability of you getting the outcome that you truly deserve. Or well, even just knowing that stock market is like gambling, that that's a myth, that even that will increase your probability of success. Well, that's right. I mean, you know, you could argue, you know, how, how, how do you approach it to, 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 to remove the gambling aspect? Well, I've just said with gambling, there's, you know, there's a probability you could win or lose. If you look at the long-term bias of the stock market over a, a 10 or 20-year period, typically there's an upward bias to it. So even if you just bought in and got your timing horribly wrong, uh, not the most sophisticated of strategies, and just let it grind, you know, arguably in 10 years' time, yeah, you potentially could be in a better position than where you're starting. Not the ideal way of approaching it. It's a long time to have something tied up, hoping it's going to move higher. So that's where we think things like uh, analysis techniques, reading the chart, reading the tape, understanding the fundamentals, uh, can go to improving the selection of asset that you buy, whether it be you know, the stock or an index. But I think the further layer that you can take over that isn't just working out which stock to buy. If you really want to stack the odds in your favor, then working on the best type of strategy to trade that stock then really does give you the ability to create a bona fide edge. Yeah, and there are certain strategies where you can dramatically tilt the odds in your favor on top of just being able to pick decent stocks, but really amplify your return and reduce your risk really potentially quite substantially uh, through smart use of strategy. Uh, and that's 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 the name of the game. It's not just about, oh yeah, which stock are we gonna buy, but how am I then going to trade that stock? Maybe I'm gonna use options, for example, to help tip my, tip my odds my way a little bit and, and be able to profit from it. Market timing as well. Don't forget to technical analysis, something that we teach when to get in, when to get out. It can make a big difference. Well, that's right. It's not just about buying the right shares. It's buying them for the right price. And so you've got to be able to analyze them or or, or assist yourself with timing, certainly, to do that. And they're learnable skills. uh, And over time, they're demonstrable in terms of the ability to value add. So stock markets like gambling, is that myth busted? Afraid so. (laughs) Done. There's one down. Number two, what about risk management in mm-hmm. terms of losses versus wins? People treat losses and, uh, and gains in much the same way, which it, it really isn't for a number of reasons. And I think you know, having risk management in play uh, with any investment strategy is crucial. Um, it's not what you make, it's what you get to keep at the end of the day. Uh, and risk management really assists in that. So if something really is going wrong, you know, you could be bloody minded and stubborn and and, and hold it uh, as it goes underwater like a boat sinking and you're holding on to it going, no, it's okay, it's going to recover. Um, you know, you got to cut them early, simple as that. Uh, and risk management in that regard is quite helpful. And I think also, you know, gains and losses aren't the same thing. If you lose 20% on an investment, you've got to make 25 on your next one to get back to square. So losses and gains on, a, on an empirical basis are not the same financially. But 
more so when you get into the psychology of it because if you make an investment in the stock market and you've done your work and you make money, that was what you expected to do. So mentally you don't treat it uh, anywhere near as seriously as when you get into a stock market investment that goes wrong, it costs you money. It's almost what you expect, right? You expect to win when you, you make an investment. You expect to win. That's the only reason you're getting into this. So when that doesn't happen, it can be a real jolt. You know, it clear your nostrils out pretty quickly, a big slap across the chops uh, that, oh, I wasn't expecting that because you've gone in with an unrealistic expectation. There are things that can happen. Even though we've talked about building an edge, um, there are things that can happen that can that can knock you off uh, that podium uh, of what you were expecting. You know, things like a force majeure, an act of terrorism, or a you know, tidal wave or an earthquake. Or, you know, these are all things in, in, in the past that have had you know, a dramatic and immediate impact uh, on markets and, and, and caused you know, catastrophic damage for people. Um, you know, you look at the earthquake in Kobe, uh, which effectively was the demise of Nick Leeson, the bearings trader, who's already in a pretty precarious position, and that tipped his account over the edge and, and, and cost him, cost the British, uh, or cost the bank he worked for over a billion pounds. So that was an example of something from left field, 9-11, something from left field. Uh, you know, an act of war or terror that's not expected can really unsettle things. So, you know, you've got to have that risk management on top of your edge in play so that psychologically you're not getting battered around. And if you keep your risk small, even if it goes wrong for you, you go, okay, well, that was you know, five, six percent, better than that being 20, back on the horse to use our gambling term, and away you go again. So losses and gains aren't the same They're thing, definitely not busted. Same. Psychologically, definitely not. Mathematically or p l or accounting-wise, definitely not. And they're really the only two lenses you can look through. So listening to this, AB, you may have some listeners out there saying, oh, you know, some of the terms these guys are using are probably a little bit out of my depth, thinking, well, the stock market's an exclusive club. It's only for rich people or stockbrokers. I've heard that many, many times. Is that necessarily the case? No, I think in the past it probably was. Um, you know, and if you look at the fee structure, for example, with stockbroking, um, you know, in the past you'd be paying at least one, sometimes one and a half percent per trade. Yeah, you know, with a big, big ticket on every time you take in, take in a trade as well. And one of the great things about clearing costs becoming far less than what they were is that that's been passed on through lower levels of brokerage charges. So the fee structure has really made it. Uh, a level of playing field for somebody that's walking out with a five or ten grand account to better get started compared to someone that's got an account in the millions. So in that respect, the field, uh, as the, the playing field has been leveled some. Also, you know, you can really look at the advent of online trading, which was the late '90s, early 2000s, as you know, E-Trade and Comsec and whatnot came to the fore. Um, you know, it, again, it's provided the ability to. Uh, to gain access to markets in a very, very simple way without the uh, the, the previous structure of your you know, double cuffed pinstripe suit wearing broker that wouldn't be interested in taking you as a new client because you don't have enough cash to make it worth their while. So it really has changed an awful lot over that period of time. Yeah, and the level of education uh, that's now available you know, through companies such as ours where we, you know, we teach people how to not just simply trade but how to make money from trading um, has opened the door for a, a, a lot of folk that previously would have left the stock market alone. And if I look through our client base, you know, we've got our fair share of high net worth individuals and ultra high net worth in some instances. Um, and equally, you know, we've got our fair share of mum and dad investors that are starting to invest for the first time. And that's something to be quite proud of. I think we've been able to open the door and, and help those people you know, burst the balloon of the myths that they may have believed and to get started and actually start making some serious dough out of the market, which is, you know, it's quite fulfilling when you actually see people do that from a, a personal perspective where I sit. But yeah, no, it's not, it's not an exclusive club anymore. It used to be, but not anymore. It's a meritocracy. And if you're in and you're active and, and, and kicking goals, that's what it's all about. That's right. And I can say as a statement of fact, we've had traders of the month who've made great money trading with five or six grand, mm. even as small as that. So yeah. absolutely not an exclusive club, open to everyone as long as you're willing to get in. Mm. Fourth, uh, let's talk about maybe the fact that when stocks uh, get pummeled, that they always recover. Stocks always recover. I've heard that before, right? If you just sit and hold and hope, mm. it all, all comes good. Is that right? No. <laughs> it's pretty flat. Busted. Busted. No, <laughs> um, done. I think, you know, it can be, you could pick up a whole bunch of different examples for, for, for different reasons. And there are some companies that enjoy a demise uh, that's quite swift. Others uh, far far more painful and more long term, and you know plenty of examples spring to mind. You think about Swifties, um, you know, think Babcock and Brown, uh, which was sort of around the time of the GFC, which was the the new Macquarie Investment Bank in Australia. Um, Zip yeah, that, Pay, 
Yeah, you know, Babcock's went from, we listed it at five, I think got up to about 36, 37, and eventually crumpled and, uh, and was gone. Um, so, no, they, and, that, and that never came back. Um, you know, if you look at Enron as an example of, you know, the most analysed stock on Wall Street during its time, I only had one analyst that said this is a sham. Everyone else is going, no, best business ever, you just don't understand enough about it, <laughs> gone. Um, you know, so there are, there are examples of those implosions. We work is uh, probably another example where, you know, fundamentally within the business, the model is wrong where you've taken um, long-term rental periods at a price of X on the basis that you can rent that space out when it's subdivided uh, into bite-sized hot desk type um, structures for much, much more. But then the shape of the market changes uh, and all of a sudden, you know, all bets are off and that business is gone. So, you know, the, the, they're examples of fairly quick uh, demises of, of businesses that have fallen out of favour. But equally, it can happen over the long term too. And it can happen to big, big names that are, that are market darlings. So I'll give, you, I'll give you an Aussie one. I'll give you a couple of US ones to, to have a mull over. If we were talking in the US, if you think about GE, um, General Electric, which you know anyone that really follows the world of investing or business leadership has probably heard of uh, GE's CEO uh, through the 80s and 90s, which was Jack Welsh. CEO of the year, just an unbelievable uh, business operator, at least it appeared on the surface insofar as you know, GE became this monolithic, enormous company that just delivered quarter after quarter of earnings growth. Uh, and, but if you look at its share price over the last 20 years, it's been in nothing but decline. It's just like a leaf dropping out of the tree, just drifting lower and lower uh, as those big conglomerate businesses that have got their fingers in all pies become less relevant in, in today's world. It's all about focus and, and, and being in your channel. Uh, equally, you know, in, it, and that's an example of a, a company uh, that's, 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 that's got, as an outlier, that's gone through that. When you look at certain sectors, uh, you know, they too have uh, you know, enjoyed uh, a, a significant demise. So, yeah, telecommunications would be a really good example of that. And you know, if you take Telstra, or if we were looking in the US, look at AT&T, which you know, the charts were almost the same. Uh, where you know, over a, a solid you know, 15, 20 year period, they've been massive underperformers. You know, in the case of Telstra, I'd say if you're in Telstra 1 and 2, you're probably in from about what $7.20 or thereabouts, currently trading at around $4 and change. And that's since you know, 2000 and what, 2000 and, oh, sorry, back about 97, I think, is when say, Telstra, yeah, yeah, 97, yeah, I think is when, when Telstra listed. So, you know, you're, you're 25 years in. And all it's delivered is this degradation of shareholder value. Um, maybe that's the decline in the fixed line business, but these are also companies that were well placed to capitalize on mobile phones, but their businesses weren't able to really do that. In the case of Telstra, perhaps it was hamstrung by being a sort of semi-government type mindset in the private sector. Uh, another alternate example would be AMP, um, you know, which is you know, one of the worst, most widely held shares in Australia. You know, again, that listed in 96, I think, and you know, the share price got over 30 bucks at one point in time. It's a dollar and change now. I think it almost less, to be honest. Uh, and, and, and it's not going to recover because it, business is finished. The value proposition that it had, the corporate values of you know, the trusted AMP advisor, they're all gone. So you've got a shell of a business with no real corporate direction that doesn't know whether it's a dealer group or whether it's a provider of investment products or, or, or what it is, uh, is really struggling to provide, you know, to find relevance. And so, no, they don't always come back. Uh, and that's why stock selection is so, so important. That ability to find an edge in choosing what kind of companies and at what time uh, and what price to pay is crucial. Myth busted, that's an easy one. Yeah. So many examples there. Last one here, AB, and we hear this a lot of the time with particularly new clients, and then thankfully we can often change their mind, is that they have a strategy and that's what they do. That's mm. all that works. In reality, it's likely about having an evolution of your strategy to, to keep up to date with what's going on in the market, right? Yeah, look, there's a, there's a, there's a thread of truth to that. Um, I think you know, strategies evolve over time. And if I, if I think about cash on demand, which is a, you know, a buy and write cover call strategy, yeah, that's a strategy I've used for, for decades, and it still works, but the implementation of it's changed. Okay. So strategies within themselves evolve. The actual overarching strategy in itself is like renting your house. Uh, okay, you own an asset and you rent it out, you pick up a rent check, that's great. But the nature of renting has changed. You can do Airbnb, for example, now, or you could have a, a multi-dwelling within a house where you rent out rooms, for example. So the, the process of owning an asset and at the top level, 
analysis is the same. You're still renting it, but the methodology is probably shifted and lit to optimize to market. So strategies do evolve, and if uh, over time, if you really want them to continue working. One that probably hasn't worked as well for investors is just this buy and hold hope mindset where I think the, you know, the world of investing really has changed an awful lot in that um, back in the day, you know, buying a blue chip share, picking up the dividends was usually a guaranteed way of making money over time. But markets have really changed an awful lot and, and you need a more um, fluid approach uh, to that kind of strategy. You know, people always talk about Warren Buffett and you know, got no question about it. The guy runs on the ball. You know, he's one of the wealthiest people on the planet and been one of the most successful investors in history. It's also underperformed the market over the last five or six years because the methodology that he uses has been less in tune with the current market. And I think there's an important point for people to note there that your strategy has to evolve when markets change. Things change all the time. Sometimes it's a subtle change that, that can escape your perception and other times it's far more material. Good example, this is music. So, you know, if you, if you want to listen to music, you know, 30 years ago, you'd have bought an LP or vinyl, you might have seen some pictures of these things, I'm sure. I've heard of them in museums. Uh, and, and you put it on your on your turntable and it crackles away and it plays your music. You didn't need an Apple Watch to tell you to get up and exercise because every 20 minutes you've got to flip the thing over. Then came the cassette tape, which you know, for driving along in your car was incredible and you had all this ability to listen to a full album of music on a cassette. Then came CDs, and you think nothing's ever going to be better than CDs. You couldn't destroy the thing. You scratch it, put it away. Incredible, all on one side, brilliant sound quality, amazing. You can't even buy a car that's got a CD player in there, a new car at least. So that's how much music consumption has, has changed in that 30-year time frame. And if you're trying to invest with the, the, the same principles of 30 years ago, you're playing with a you know, potentially quite outdated game plan. And yeah, the big picture's the same. You want to buy good quality businesses at the right price, but the techniques or approaches that are used to help you identify them definitely have shifted. You know, everyone's got charts now. 30 years ago, people didn't have access to charting, for example, to help them with their timing. They didn't have speed of execution. They didn't have an internet which delivers news at light speed. You know, oh, you read it in the paper a day later, and then the day after that, your broker would do the trade. So that lag factor was it. That's all changed. And so I think it's very, very important to make sure that you know you have an evolving trading strategy, not one that changes every two minutes, but one that you tinker with and continue to enhance by reviewing your processes and results regularly, for sure. AB, I think there's five really good myths that we've covered off in there, and hopefully we've maybe opened some minds for our listeners out there. So thank you very much. Any parting words today? I think, we, I mean, that's in of itself, it speaks for itself. You know, you've got to, you've got to evolve. If you're not evolving and growing, um, you're going to go into decline. And that's exactly what's happened with the likes of AT&T and AMP. No vision of where they're going and no approach to changing it. And that's why they've declined and trading strategies can be exactly the same. Don't fall into that. Buy, hold long term. Make sure you upskill. Make sure you have a level of control with what you're doing. Make sure you review it regularly and make sure it stays relevant. Myths busted. Thank you, AB. My pleasure. Anytime. There you have it, guys. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Most importantly, hit that notification button, and we'll look forward to hosting you next week.